just to kind of get us started, how many of you heard, have heard of the happiness rankings? A few of you? Who are the happiest countries in the world? Do you know? You know, in, who just who who said Norway? Norway. She yeah, did. Yeah, about, yeah. Well done. That's exactly who it is. So the United Nations each year releases a famous report. It's called the Happiness Rankings, and they say which countries are the happiest in the world. Do you know where they get that data? They get it from Gallup. And that question that we ask around the planet is we say, and this is now done in 150 countries, we say to people, rate your life on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is the worst possible life and 10 is the best possible life. Where do you stand today? So the people, on average, that say that their life is the best are Norwegians. They rate their lives about an 8 on average. People who say their lives are the worst are in places like the Palestinian territories or Haiti. And then they stack rank that. Now my hunch is, is that many of you are familiar with these rankings and that when you consume them it's more for purposes of entertainment and not necessarily for policy. And why? Because you think, well how could people really know how happy they are? Or why would I ever use this in the first place? I use hard traditional economic indicators, not mood or sentiment. We would suggest that that would be a flawed approach. And we would caution you against consuming it in that fashion. Here's why. We did a look back at the Arab Spring. And this one, that's GDP per capita in Egypt from 2005 to about 2011. If you look at GDP per capita, which of course many of us rely on in terms of health of societies, money transactions, it grew in almost a perfect linear fashion. Are many of you familiar with the Human Development Index that the UN puts out? Very familiar. What did the Human Development Index show for Egypt? Exactly the same trend. It showed perfect progress over a five-year period. If you look at it for Tunisia, exactly the same trends for both GDP per capita and the Human Development Index. And if you look at it for Bahrain, again, three countries that fell victim to the Arab Spring, all showed perfect progress. Why? Because what that data told us is what people were spending and what they were making, but it didn't tell us how they were feeling. So we went in and we said, how are you feeling? This is what they told us. We found that 29% of people were thriving. That put Egypt roughly on par with the global median at that time. It collapsed down to 9% in the lead up to the Arab Spring, putting Egypt on par with the Palestinian territories. Tunisia followed exactly the same trajectory in Bahrain, had the most dramatic decline from 2009 to 2011, going from 44% of people that were thriving all the way down to 11%. Also putting that economy, which I believe is the 35th richest economy in the world, down to a place that looked more like the Palestinian territories. Now again, this information that we once possibly consumed for entertainment is actually telling us some of the most important intelligence on the ground. It's telling us what people are thinking and how they're feeling. You know, Danny Kahneman, who's a Nobel laureate now, he's become famous for one thing, behavioral economics. And the revolution of behavioral economics tells us that much of economics or rational theory, the rational person, is wrong. And that most of the decisions that we make are not made based on rational choice. That actually most of them are made on irrational choice. And if you had to quantify it, only 30% of what we do is rational. And 70% is irrational. So why is it at a macro level that when we're looking at trends, we're only doing so on the rational side and we're not on the irrational side? Well, this is, exists to close that gap. Now, how do we collect this information and where do we collect it? So the way that we do this and this is just the data collection process for Nigeria, one country. In 110 countries, we do face-to-face -face interviewing. 
we break all countries up into regions that perfectly represent an equal sized population. And then in each one of those, we interview roughly eight to 12 people for a total of 1,000 in each country around the planet. And then we interview in 150 countries. This is actually what it looks like in the field. So this is a man interviewing a woman in Indonesia. Again, a face-to-face -face interview, not just in capital cities. They are nationally representative surveys. We go out to the furthest parts of every single country on the planet. Here's just another example. This is Mongolia. We're still doing paper and pencil in this particular country. And one last example is Myanmar. To date, we've almost conducted surveys in 170 countries. This is our coverage. The places in gray are where we have not conducted surveys. So you'll see North Korea is one of those places, Papua New Guinea, where they speak, I believe, 800 different languages. So we translate every questionnaire into every single uh, major language that's spoken. If 5% of the country speaks a language, we make it available in that particular language. We can do Papua New Guinea, it's just really expensive. And we've spent over $150 million collecting all this information. So this is our coverage. Um, around the planet. Now, I want to show you just a few graphs because what I showed you with Egypt, Tunisia, and Bahrain is not isolated to just those countries. Here's another significant event around the planet. We, of course, remember the events that happened in Ukraine. Here are the traditional economic indicators that we rely on in terms of how society was progressing. Of course, the Maidan Revolution happened, you can see where the global economic crisis affected Ukraine, and then you can see what happened to GDP per capita after the Maidan revolution happened. It went down. Very simple narrative. But it didn't tell us anything about the lead up to the Maidan revolution. But what may have is how people were feeling. And this is what we learned. That 21% drop to 11%. If that was unemployment and unemployment increased by 10%, policymakers everywhere would be focused on it. Yet when people are feeling differently, so much so that this discontent can be picked up in a quantitative way at the national level, nobody talks about it. Here's another one that you may be familiar with. The UK. Here's the money transactions before Brexit. The quarter before Brexit happened, the British economy grew at 2%. In fact, when you look at unemployment, the quarter before Brexit, unemployment dropped for the first time below 5%. All traditional economic indicators told us that everything in the UK was fine. So, how are people feeling? The drop in 2013 to 2015 is one of the most significant two-year drops we've seen in the entire history of our database of all countries around the planet. If that 15-point drop was an increase in unemployment, again, front page news. Every policymaker would be talking about it. But when people feel differently, they don't. Our hope is that that changes and that people do start caring about these new metrics of well-being. And a big reason for this, by the way, is that these economic indicators, and if you look at the fathers of things like GDP per capita, Simon Kuznets, who once produ uh, presented this to Congress in the United States almost 80 years ago, said, don't use this as a barometer for the health of a society. And why? Because if you build a prison right in the middle of a community, that community will get wealthier. GDP per capita will increase, but it doesn't mean people's lives got better. So we need metrics for how people's lives are going that can be supplemented by things like unemployment and GDP per capita. Here's another graph. We're all familiar about the rise of China economically. How are people doing in China? Our data would suggest that people's lives are getting a lot better in China very quickly. It's doubled over the past decade. 
Here's another one, India. And what's amazing, we know this, if you pick up The Economist any week, we know what economics look like. Things are getting better, not as quickly as in China, but things are getting better economically. But how are people's lives going? That's one of the most dramatic drops we've seen over a 10-year period. There's an academic in Europe that took similar data, and he wrote a white paper, and he said, I can predict elections with life satisfaction data. And he said the famous quote by Ronald Reagan when he said, ask yourself, do you feel like your life is better now than it was four years ago? Because if not, vote for me. He says in his white paper, I can prove that that's true. What our data suggests is that it's not just true for democracies and that it might also be true for non-democracies. Okay, here's just two trends that I think will be of interest to you from Africa. Here's GDP per capita in Sierra Leone. But when it comes to well-being, you could argue that Sierra Leone has made some of the greatest gains over the past decade. Now 26% of people are thriving in Sierra Leone. Wow. Okay, I have another one. And this also is another trend. So I, I looked at I looked at every country, <laughs> and I found these two to be the most interesting. Any guesses on Morocco? They too have made incredible progress over the past decade. From 7% in 2010. But again, these are data that don't come from Western experts. These data come from people that are the best experts on these countries, which are the people themselves. Here's the exact ranking. This is my last slide. That's every single country and the percentage of people that are thriving. You'll see that Morocco and Sierra Leone are among the highest. And I will also draw your attention to something that has surprised us, which is Rwanda. That's among the lowest on the entire graph. Now, all these data we make available. This is my business card. <laughs> so <laughs> if any of you are interested in receiving these, we would be more than happy to send you the full report on any country that we have available um, because we have most trends in Africa available. In fact, there are some governments that access these data on a very regular basis. We work with the governments of those countries. Um, so if you'd be interested in that, please feel free to send me an email. And thank you for having an interest in Gallup's work. <laughs>